Hughes syndrome is a combination of blood clotting, uh, which can affect, for instance, different organs such as the placenta. So patients can get recurrent miscarriages, they can get clots in the veins, or they can get even more worrying clots in, for instance, the brain, giving migraines, headaches, and even strokes. It's a blood test. Uh, it's got a fancy name, ACL, but th that's by the by. And it's a blood test that's available at all district general hospitals. Um, so I, I think more and more people who have unexpected thrombotic problems, they actually can include serious problems like heart attacks, uh, visual loss and so on, should be tested. We, we've discovered very early on now exactly 25 years ago when we first discovered this large group of patients that the women had recurrent miscarriages as I say some of them had multiple miscarriages tragically you know a dozen miscarriages and perhaps even worse some of them got into late pregnancy and then lost the baby I actually got pregnant very easily when we started to try for a family but um, at around 11 weeks I miscarried and then I miscarried again and again and again. In fact, I had five miscarriages before I was diagnosed with Hughes. The length of the, the pregnancies before I miscarried varied enormously. One was 11 weeks, one was very early, five weeks, but I'd still had a positive pregnancy test. Others were seven. And I did have vaguely strange symptoms quite frequently during that time of very swollen ankles, feeling dizzy, I fainted a couple of times, rashes and so on, which no one picked up. In fact, um, I remember calling NHS Direct at one point and they just said, oh, you need to lie down and eat a bit more. And I had no idea what it was. No, I didn't know anything about it until I was actually seeing my thyroid doctor because I have another autoimmune disorder uh, to do with my thyroid, and he said, it, this might be Hughes. I had no idea what he was talking about. And luckily, or unluckily, he was right, and I got treatment. What was happening each time when I got pregnant was that small clots were forming in the placenta, which was starving the baby of nutrients and oxygen, and eventually, each time it died. Treating these women, who used to have a failure rate of over 80%, they're now 90% successful in pregnancy. These are women who have 12, 14 miscarriages, now getting treated either with aspirin or heparin, which is another thing that thins the blood. The next time I was pregnant, I was treated with aspirin and clexane and had a completely normal pregnancy. When I found out I was pregnant with my son, who now is. Uh, it was a very strange feeling because we didn't want to celebrate the fact that we were pregnant. We would say to ourselves, well, I'm a little bit more pregnant today. I'm a little bit more pregnant today, but how long is this going to last? So that when nine months came, we were delirious with joy. Um, and he was a completely normal baby, which was fantastic. We see patients from all over the world, still many not diagnosed even after four or more miscarriages, although that's changing fast, I'm pleased to say. And of course it's a revolution. They now go on to, as I say, aspirin or heparin and are carried through to term or not quite to term. We try and deliver early in many cases. And some of our women are having two or three. We have a party every year at St. Thomas's for women who've had their babies and we have jelly and cream and ice cream and all that. In severe cases, I'm sad to say that you can get a coronary or angina, the age of 20, for instance. If you see a young person with unexpected angina, this is certainly something to think about. Uh, or it can present as a clot in the brain, which is a stroke. Or multiple little clots called TIAs. So the patient starts talking rubbish or mumbling or weakness in one arm. And again, this famous figure of one in five comes up. A, a very good study from Rome, from colleagues of mine, found that if they looked at young strokes, people of 45 and under, at one in five were due to Hughes syndrome. When I suffered the stroke, I was 24 years of age. 
I was very active. I just finished drama school. I was working as a waitress, cycling about 15, 20 miles a day all around London. And even though I'd been diagnosed with lupus, um, I didn't realise anything else was wrong at the time and was very busy and very outgoing. When I first started suffering the effects of the stroke, um, I had pins and needles in my right hand um, and then it spread to the right side of my face. And um, I, was, I was anxious to start with and then obviously became incredibly frightened when I thought that it was a stroke. Um, it then became numb and I had numbness all the way up my, my right arm and the side of my face and that moved on to sort of, yeah, loss of use of that side. Um, and the whole time you're thinking, how much further is it going to spread? Is it going to come to my leg as well? Am I going to lose my speech? You know, you, you sort of, you're panicking, but at the same time thinking, I need to get help. And no, very, very frightening, very frightening. I think we associate strokes with an older generation, um, people that have maybe smoked a lot or drank a lot, not particularly fit, not particularly healthy. Um, and yeah, but I think that's probably what I thought and had absolutely no idea it would affect young people, young, healthy, fit people. Um, essentially, I, you know, I sort of already knew there was something wrong with me, but a lot of people, this will be the first sign. They'll suddenly have a stroke at 20 or 24. And I think that, that's very scary, and I don't think anybody realises that. I think that is the shocking thing. So long as they're on anticoagulants, so long as they're treated, they're safe. And the critical thing is for the doctors and the patients to keep the blood thin. In other words, if you're on a drug called warfarin, you must have a blood test called an INR. And I always regard it as like Tesco's milk, you know. It should be half cream or even one third cream. So it should not be rich blood, but one third. And so long as it's at that level, then the patient does away with the headaches, does away with the ischemic attacks, memory loss. And many of my patients nowadays, and it, I encourage them if possible, test their own blood. They get the machine, finger prick for INR, and it really opens up their lives. Finally having a diagnosis that makes sense is, is such a relief. And even though it's a diagnosis that potentially is quite a frightening one and a daunting one, actually knowing what it is and knowing that you have the power to treat it um, and you can take medication that can actually improve your life and massively reduce your risk of having another stroke or of dying on a sort of daily basis. Um, yeah, you can't ask for anything more really. Knowing what it is is the key.